Hey guys, it's been a long time since uploading an educational video and this video is going to be about gravitation. I really value your time so if you want to skip to the part which is relevant to you, the timestamps are in the description. So I'll bring you through different misconceptions that I had in gravitation as I studied it during my exams and I went through lectures. Let's come to the first point right here which is vectors and scalars. The huge problem with this in this topic of gravitation, there are four so-called variables. One is force, correct? One is gravitational field strength, potential, and potential energy. Now you have to make the distinction between which is the vector and which are scalars. I had a deep trouble with this. So when questions asked me to calculate stuff, correct? I had a lot of trouble. So how did I address this. So which are the vectors? Force is a vector, right? Force is obviously a vector. Is G a vector? Let's study what is G. G is F over M, correct? Force divided by the mass. F is equals to Mg. So this here is also a vector. Potential, this is the part which I was confused. Potential is a scalar quantity. And just because is represented by minus gm over r. This is minus gmm over r, correct? Just because it has a negative sign does not imply does not imply it is a vector. Negative signs have nothing to do with a vector. Vectors have a magnitude and a direction. These are the two things that define a vector, not the negative sign. So if you are given an example question, okay, you have three bodies, okay, they are situated at a distance of say r, r away from each other. By the way, if you can't see what's written on this whiteboard, all the photos of the each of the screens are in the description. So take a look. Now, each of this is r, correct? Now if they ask you during the exam, at this point, which is equally distant from these three planets, what is the potential? Okay, potential, I mean this one. The potential is a scalar, correct? Since it's a scalar, you can just add them like numbers. What do I mean by add them like numbers? 1 plus 1 is 2, 3 plus 4 is 7. Like that, you can just add it as, I'll, I'll put it here right here. Minus G M1 over R1 plus minus G M2 over R2 plus dot 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 depending on the number of planets that's in the system. The thing here is you can just add them together because they are scalars. However, if they ask you instead to calculate the force or the gravitational field strength at this point A, then you can't just add them like you do like numbers. Then so what can you do, you're asking me? You have to do vector addition and subtraction. Then we, then what will you do? Yes, I had the exact same trouble. What you should do is go back to the main topic of vectors, which is studied in measurement. So what happens to vectors? Vectors right here can be resolved. So to calculate either of these quantities, you resolve it in the x direction and the y direction by finding the angles or you can actually apply your sine or cosine rule have you guys have heard of that because this force is this way this way and this way am i right so you can use the concepts of a vector triangle you can find the resultant of these two forces which is this way and then minus it off from this one to get the resultant gravitational force or you can resolve it in the x and y directions right here which is a bit harder, so you would have to resolve it in like these three forces, right? This component and this force. You resolve it in the x and y directions, which would be more complicated. You would have to know the angles and stuff. So using a vector diagram like what I showed here would help you much better. So the main understanding is the distinction between vectors and scalars in gravitation. And number two is this question right here, which I had so much problem with. Why? in the world is GPE or potential negative? 
This was a huge question, even though I've watched a lot of lecture videos and a lot of YouTube videos to try to understand why is this the case, it took me a long time to understand this. So be sure to watch this and stick with me. The first reason can be addressed through principle of conservation of energy. Okay, a great abbreviation for it. So we have a planet, okay, we call it M for, for I don't know why. We call this point infinity. This is an arbitrary point, okay, it doesn't exist. It's really, really far away from this planet M. Let's imagine, guys, say, we have this random dude ball, which we'll call it a ball, okay, at infinity. We are going to consider energy of this ball. This total energy of this ball, right, is the sum of two things. Kinetic energy plus GPE, am I right? However, we assume the first assumption of this question, which is GPE, or the potential, at infinity is equals to zero. Okay, you, can, you can consider the unit by yourself. It is zero. So this thing is zero. Correct? By principle of conservation of energy, energy cannot be created, cannot be destroyed, can be converted. And the energy will always have the same value, regardless of where you move the freaking ball. So if the ball were to move closer, right, to this planet M, because it feels this sense of attraction, okay, this, it will experience the gravitational attraction of the planet M. There will be this gravitational force is acting on a ball. This gravitational force will naturally tend to accelerate the ball because you know F is equal to MA, right? So this thing would exist. There will be an acceleration, which means that there will be a change in velocity, which in turn means there's a change in kinetic energy. Correct? If there's a change in kinetic energy, but you know that kinetic energy is a scalar quantity. Correct? Right? And kinetic energy can't be negative, it can only be positive. So, if kinetic energy becomes positive, correct? GP is zero, this is zero. A KE starts becoming positive, then your GPE must be negative, correct? So that it will sum to zero and this law will hold. And where does the kinetic energy manifest? And a lot of books don't cover this. This kinetic energy right here, what is this? Shouldn't, okay, if we look at the Earth and the Moon, shouldn't the Moon be crashing towards us because of this accelerating kinetic energy? No, it wouldn't. Because this kinetic energy is stored in this thing called circular motion. Circular motion. The circular motion of the Moon around Earth correct? That is the kinetic energy. That is this kinetic, positive kinetic energy. And a lot of big books don't cover this, so please understand. This is a very important point. And let's bring you to the second explanation, which is the work done, which is, I think, a lot in your book. So let's try to understand this. Gravitational force is attractive in nature. This ball will experience a force this way. Now, this Okay, the external force, right, has to do positive work to separate this ball because the ball and the M are so attracted to each other because of this gravitational force, the external force has to pull them apart. Right? And when you pull them apart, when you try to pull it away, you're doing positive work. Am I right? You're doing positive work. But the first assumption that we have here is that GPE or potential at infinity is zero, correct? Zero. So if you're doing positive work to reach zero, shouldn't all the points away from infinity towards planet M be negative? Correct? So that is the two explanations and a very important distinction I would like you to make and please don't lose marks because of this. External force has a direction. It has a direction. However, work done does not have a direction. Guys, work done is a scalar. Please don't say work done is in the opposite direction of the displacement, which doesn't make sense, correct? So yeah, these are the two explanations. Conservation of energy as well as 
work done on this presentation. Right now comes the bit of a nightmare part in exams, which is binary systems. Or binary planet systems to be more specific. Now, what are binary planet systems? You have two planets, alright? Planet 1 and planet 2. And they are said to go about circular motion around a common center. So we we'll label this as the common center. But a big problem is we don't know how to calculate, how do we make calculations? What exactly is happening right here? Let me explain to you, okay? So how do you first find the common center? This is to do with the concept of moments, the concept of defining a system, which is something that I covered in the free body diagram video. So please watch that. The link is up there. So what is this common center? Okay, we're going to make it really simple. We have a ruler, okay? We have a ball of clay right here. Okay, which is of a certain mass m and a big ball or lump of clay right here of a mass m all right now it's very simple we don't consider the gravitational force between these two lumps of clay because these are acting along the ruler and they don't produce any moments about a pivot so if we define a pivot say at this point right here Yes, it just passes through the pivot. There's no, we don't care about the gravitational force, am I right? So we only consider the masses of this and this. So to find the common center, the common center is basically where you put a finger right here and the ruler just balances. It does not topple. It's like a seesaw. So it just balances. How do you find it? You equate the anti-clockwise and the clockwise moment. So your Okay, let's assume this distance right here to here is okay r this distance from here to here okay to be more specific to the center is r so m g r is equals to m g m g r correct and then you can calculate down the moments and then you find the r and the r and that's pretty simple. It's the exact same thing, guys, which are applied to the planet systems. Just taking these two things as a system and a ruler that's connecting the center of masses, and you're just applying the moments, okay? So if the exam comes, use this one. The second thing is what in the freaking world is going on in this system? Where, what happens? What is the circular motion? What is the dynamics and all this? Let's cover this right here, okay? Now, the fundamental thing that gives you the immediate one mark for any circular motion or gravitational question is that the GF, the gravitational force, provides the centripetal force to carry out circular motion. Why? Gravitational force converts to the centripetal force for these two planets to undergo uniform circular motion about where? About the common center. About common center. This is when circular motion occurs. Now, what is a gravitational force? The gravitational force, right, Fg is G M M over R squared. It doesn't care if the objects are moving or the objects are not moving. It only cares about the R, the product of the masses. That's it, okay? So, taking the same analogy right here, Okay, we just reproduced it here. Gravitational force is this distance. What is the distance? Distance between the two planets, R plus R. So G, M, M over, look at this, look at this part, R plus R squared. It's not relative to the pivot, not relative to the common center. It is between these two planets, all right? And for the circular force, however, this is where it gets different. If we're looking at this planet M, we say this one is M V square over R. Okay? This R, okay? Only this R, because this is the common center around which they are rotating. However, if you're looking at the big planet, then instead of being this, it will be M V square over big R. Okay? 
Get it guys? And then you can calculate it out. The main distinction is this one and this one. So please note this the next time you answer a binary system question. The fourth concept in gravitation is about graphs. And this is probably a big problem that many people have. And me myself struggle. So let's try to understand graphs. And we're going to deal with the same binary like two planet systems right here. We have planet A, we have planet B, M, M. We're going to look at one type of graph. Okay? From this center, the potential, and this thing, correct? Which is the R. Now we're going to draw some really cool graphs right now. For the potential curve, in the exam, they give it for you. For example, they draw it like this, and it ends at the center. Now in the kinematics video, the link up there, I discussed what you should take note when looking at graphs, correct? First thing you take note is what is the relationship that's being portrayed right here. This is a potential versus R distance graph. So immediately think of this formula coming in, right? You see the negative sign? No wonder the entire graph is below the axis. So let's look at what's happening. What does the gradient of this curve represent? Of a graph, g minus d4. What does the gradient of this curve represent? The gradient of this curve is d5 over dr. And you study probably in your school notes that it is g. However, don't forget the negative sign. g is equals to minus d5 over dr. So what you can do? From this graph, I want you guys to draw the g against our graph. How do you do that? Very simple. This is just math, okay? You flip this graph above the axis. So let me draw the graph right here. Okay? So this is the... Okay? You flip this graph. So you will get like that, something like that. And then you draw the gradient graph of this. This part right here, the gradient is zero. This part right here, the gradient is negative. This part is positive. So when you draw the graph, it would look something like negative, zero, positive. So it would be like something like that. But of course, this one would be a bit more longer. This one wouldn't go that long because, because this planet is bigger, right? It has a greater g pole. So this one's going to go much further. Okay? So that would be a point at which it becomes zero. And what does this zero represent? The common center. So at that point, if you were to place an object, it wouldn't move in any direction. It wouldn't feel any net force, okay? Now, this is a potential against R. This is a G against R. What are the two other quantities? F and, let me think, potential energy, correct? However, F is equals to mg, U is equals to m phi. So, M is a scalar, correct? So the F and the G graph, right, would technically look the same, just that it would be, hmm, it would be a bit, it would be a bit more, a bit more of a higher slope because you're multiplying it by a constant. And that actually doesn't make sense. It depends on whether it is smaller than one or greater than one, correct? So, but you get the idea. I want you guys to be really familiar with converting from one graph form to the other. So there's nothing to be scared of when a graph question comes in your exams, okay? The fifth most important point has to do with the concept of acceleration of free fall at equator versus poles. An acceleration of free fall is the same at the equator and the poles Think about the concept of circular motion, it wouldn't be the case. So let's talk about what's happening, okay? You have a, okay, this is the poles, this is the equator. Okay, I don't believe in this flat earth, round earth, all this kind of complicated stuff, earth is just round, okay? So at the equator, right, let's look at this. Let's say you have a man, okay, and a man is carrying a ball, okay, a man right here is carrying this ball right here 
at the equator, correct? Both this ball and the man is undergoing uniform circular motion, correct? So, let's look at this ball only. The ball experiences what kinds of forces? First, intuitively, gravitational force, Fg. Why is this Fg? G, M, M over R squared. The masses of the Earth as well as the mass of the ball. So this Fg is equal to the sum of two components. The centripetal force because it's in circular motion as well as the remaining component which is the acceleration of free fall. So the free fall force or the acceleration of free fall. Now this one can be calculated using this formula. At the poles, right? Let's look at the poles first. At the poles, there's no circular motion, correct? You're not rotating about any, you're right, like literally passing through it. So this thing at the poles, okay, FC is zero, correct? So your free fall acceleration, the free fall force is equal to the G. So the acceleration of free fall is equal to your gravitational constant. However, at the equator, since you're going circular motion, part, okay, part of it is converted to centripetal force. So your acceleration of free fall, correct, which is, if you move this over, it's equals to Fg minus Fc, it will be smaller. So your A free fall will actually be smaller than G, just very negligibly smaller, okay? So we don't need to care about that during exams, it's very negligible. But please make the distinction between why this is happening. These are the biggest five misconceptions. If this video helped you, do share it with your friends. It's totally fine. And do subscribe if you want to. Do click on the subscribe button and stay tuned for my next video. Thank you.